Thank you all for joining us for this uh, webinar number two as uh, uh, RS3 webinar series. Uh, today, we will be talking about seepage and consolidation problem. Uh, I'm Ali Reza, one of the geomechanic specialists. And uh, at the beginning, I would like to apologize for the <clears throat> for my voice. And uh, I'll try to do my best to convey the message that we have in this webinar. So uh, schematically, illustrated here, you can see all the outflows and inflows affecting groundwater regime in the domain. We have rainfall, we can have a flow over the surface going to the river, we have the interaction between the river and soil layers, and also we have a infiltration going through the ground layers, we have different bedrocks, uh, aquifers, we have aquitards, we have waters being pumped in and out of the domain. <clears throat> all these uh, phenomenon that you can see in this picture schematically, we can simulate them and model them properly and adequately and accurately in RS3. Uh, we have different methods in RS3 uh, to establish the pore water pressure distribution in the domain. Uh, the simple options that we have, we have named it as phreatic surface. Within this option, you can define the water surface. And if you have a water surface in the domain, uh, the pore water pressure in the domain will be uh, calculated based on the coordinate of the nodes that you are interested in with respect to the water surface. The other option that we have is pore water pressure point set. Uh, within option, <clears throat> with this option, you define a set of coordinates of points, and for each of these points, you define the total head pressure head or pore water pressure. And using interpolation and extrapolation techniques, at any points that you need to count, you need to have the value of pore water pressure in the domain. You can uh, use these point sets and calculate those pore water pressures. The advanced method that we have here for groundwater and establishment of the pore water pressure in the domain is uh, our finite element seepage analysis. We have that for steady state condition and transient. Uh, we will be talking about the finite element seepage analysis here, the more complex method. And uh, to begin with, since we are <clears throat> doing groundwater analysis, the main purpose is to address pore water pressure total and all that. Uh, here are the definition, the basic definition that we will be using. If you have a point A at a depth below the water table and you have a datum to measure your uh, vertical coordinates, your total head for this point A is going to be H. Your pressure head is going to be Psi, which is the uh, depth of the point below the water table, and your pore pressure is going to be uh, pressure head multiplied by gamma W. And since we are doing a uh, finite element analysis, this is a boundary value problem, we need to assign the boundary condition in the domain. The basic and boundary conditions that we have for our finite element analysis are listed here. <clears throat> we can assign total head, pressure head, pore pressure. We can assign nodal flow, which is pumping water in and out of the system. We have infiltration or recharge, which could be from uh, precipitation or evaporation, and we have seepage phase. And for transient condition, <clears throat> we have transient boundary condition, and that could be any time dependent tabular function of uh, the boundary condition that I mentioned above. Now, what are these boundary conditions? Uh, schematically shown here, you see an embankment. Uh, this is upstream, this is the water table upstream, and you have the downstream, and this is the water table at downstream. Uh, <clears throat> along the boundaries of ABC and EFG, you have total head. Uh, the ABC total head is coming from the body of the water that is standing here. So the elevation of this water table is going to be your total head. Downstream, the elevation of this water table is going to be your total head. And then you have the impermeable no flow boundary HI. That could be your impermeable bedrock. And in finite element, basically, any boundary that you don't assign any boundary condition to it, it's going to be a no-flow boundary condition. And we have a rather complex boundary condition here, seepage phase TE, which I will explain it uh, in detail later. So total head <clears throat> means that you have a head constant at a given location. In other words, that is implies that uh, you have inexhaustible supply of water. So looking at this uh, left figure here, if you have a swamp or a river here, because of the body of water that you have here, you can assign total head boundary condition to this boundary here at the base of this uh, swamp. 
even if you are excavating a pit next to the swamp or the river and you are dewatering through the pit and the water table stays the same in the swamp or the river, you can still assume that, okay, this is total head. If the rate of dewatering is such that the swamp is drying or the river disappearing, then you will not have that constant head in this area anymore. Uh, nodal flow <clears throat> will be constant rate of injection or extraction of the water from the domain. And when you are solving your finite element simulation, the seepage analysis, the head will be calculated to produce that specific flow at that node that you specified. Now, interesting boundary condition, seepage phase, that simply means that your uh, total head, H, defined here, must never exceed the elevation head, Z. So going back to the definition, as C page phase, H less than or equal to Z, total head is equal to uh, pressure head plus elevation head. So that means that your pressure head is always less than or equal to zero. And that means, in other words, means that you have the maximum part pressure that is limited to zero for that point. Or simply, you can say that there is no water standing on top of that node. Where do we have this? Uh, the physical meaning of it is that you have the saturated zone intersecting the ground surface at atmospheric pressure, and you have water discharge as evaporation or downhill film of flow in this area. So this water table coming from uh, the ground water going to this stitch, this area here you have the seepage phase. So oh, the general location of this uh, seepage phase boundary is known to us, this location, but the length of it is usually, uh, we don't know that, know that prior to calculation and we have to solve for it. Now, infiltration is the volume of the water entering or leaving an area. So this could be uh, rainfall or evaporation and you can assign this kind of boundary condition to surfaces. Now, uh, <clears throat> we know the basic definition of boundary condition. We will look at some uh, simulations here. Uh, what I have for you today, we have a levee uh, with relief well problem. We will look at a steady state dam. And also for consolidation part, we are looking at a stage construction of an embankment on top of a clay layer. This brown material is clay. And we will look at the generation of excess pore water pressure and the, its dissipation. So starting with the levee, uh, <clears throat> the story starts with the 2D sections that we have for this levy. Uh, these are the 2D sections that we have from RS2. And uh, what you see here, we have the water table behind this sheet pipe, behind the wall, uh, that is standing at elevation of 115 feet. And on the downstream, you have your seepage phase. And we are trying to see the effect of these relief wells. And uh, these relief wells, for example, here they have, they are getting the same total head up. Uh, the top surface here, 106.5, 106 and we are trying to look at the effect of the water, these relief wells, on the distribution of pore water pressure in the domain, and also uh, the factor of safety that we have for this levy. In 2D, these two cases are illustrated here for you. Uh, this is the case that you don't have any relief wells, and this is the distribution of pore water pressure in the domain. This uh, purple magenta line is the phreatic surface, and for this case, we have the factor of safety critical SRF from finite element and factor of safety Spencer method from limited equilibrium, which is equivalent to 1.2. When you have the relief wells, the pore water pressure distribution is changing. And also the water surface comparing to this case is lower. And based on this, you're getting a factor of safety in a critical SRF of 1.65. So you can see the effect of uh, the relief wells on the stability. But the thing is that what we are looking at here is a 2D analysis. The assumption is that the relief wells are present along the length of the levee, normal to the plane here, everywhere. In reality, we have a distance between the relief wells, like uh, maybe they are installed at every 100 feet, every 50 feet, every 20 feet. They are apart from each other with a distance. And what we are going to look at here, we are going to uh, see what is the effect of uh, the distance that we have for these relief cells from each other. So the model that I'll create for you, uh, the steps of the modeling, I will uh, show you the project setting for the groundwater analysis. We will create the geometry and uh, assign the material properties. We use the segmenter tool to create the relief wells here. 
we assign the groundwater boundary condition, we do the mesh, refine the mesh if needs be, we compute and we look at the results. Okay. okay uh, we are starting with the <coughs> initial file. This is our S3 file that only has the project setting and also the material properties that we will be using in the problem, in, the, in this problem. So let's start with the project setting. Uh, the units are imperial and I'm using uh, feet, uh, foot and pounds and the permeability units is feet per second. Uh, we are interested only in groundwater analysis. So in the groundwater tab, we are running a steady state analysis. In case you would like to run a uh, solid analysis after that, I would always recommend to activate that negative pore water pressure cutoff. That is going to uh, affect how you calculate your effective stresses uh, in unsaturated zones. So this is okay. Let's look at the material properties that we have here. <clears throat> so uh, let's look at the hydraulic properties. Uh, we have levy fill with the permeability, permeability of 1e minus 8 feet per second. And we have different methods for the permeability function for considering unsaturated cases. What I'm using here is a simple case in which we are uh, dropping the permeability in the unsaturated zone by a factor when you are uh, going above water table. So we have the levy field, we have two layers of uh, two clay materials, we have the retaining wall and a silty sand, silty clay. Okay. Now, uh, what I have for geometry, I have the RS2 geometries. So I will import the section that I had in uh, RS2 these are all polylines that I extracted from RS2 file. And as you see here, I'll select all of them. Uh, in RS2, the vertical dilation is in Y direction. In RS3, it's in Z. So what I need to do first is to rotate all of these 90 degrees. So I'm selecting the whole thing. Now I will rotate it around origin and around axis X and 90 degrees. Let's preview. So what you see here, this was the original. Now uh, everything is in Z direction. So we have the vertical aligned properly in RS3. Okay. And we can bring all of them in in RS3. Now we have the 2D section. And what I would like to do, I would like to extrude this for 200 feet and I put my relief wells at the intervals of 50 feet, and I investigate the effect of these uh, wells on the pore water pressure distribution. Okay, to do that, I'm selecting the whole bunch of these polylines, and I will go to extrude. I'm creating closed volumes, extruding along y axis with offset of minus 100 feet and depth of 200 so that my section is going to be actually in the middle. Preview. This is the 3D geometry that we are working with. Okay. Now, as we mentioned before, uh, the extent of model that you are solving is going to be your external boundary. None of these are assigned as external boundary. I will select the biggest one, go to geometry and set that one as external. Now you have that lock icon appearing from this in front of this entity. So this is going to be the extent of my model. The rest of these pieces of geometry, they don't interact with this piece of uh, with the model yet, unless I do divide all. And now all these pieces, they have lock in front of them. These are volumes that I can use in my calculations. Uh, the next step would be assigning the material properties to different zones that I need. The best way to do that, I will go through assign material using cut plane. And these are the list of the material that I have in the domain, and this is a section. So I will put my levy in this area. I'll grab the retaining wall, put it here. Uh, clay, the green material is in these areas. Uh, silty clay in these areas, and also this region 
and the other clay at this location. So everything is assigned in a domain. Okay, you have the whole 3D model present for you. Now to define the boundary condition 115 at the upstream, uh, I'm bringing a plane and uh, to create that geometry for assigning that boundary condition, a horizontal plane at the elevation of 150. To do that, I'll go to geometry, primitive geometry, I'll bring a plane, and that plane is going to be located at elevation 115. Okay, once again, I will divide all so that those pieces of geometry that I need to assign the boundary condition are created for me. Uh, I can go to entity selection. These two pieces of levy that are separated from each other because of that plane that I just introduced, I can join them together if I want by union operation. Now, the other thing is that I would like to assign uh, relief valves in this body at intervals of uh, 50 feet. Uh, to do that, I'm using, let me hide these two pieces of geometry in front of it so that you know what we are doing. I'm selecting them, hiding them, and let's maximize this view. This piece of geometry, I will divide it into <clears throat> four pieces. I can go to geometry, Boolean, segmenter, and along the y-axis, I divide it into four pieces. Each piece, 50 feet, uh, lens and you can preview to see that okay uh, these are the locations that I actually I would put my relief valves along this body so we do segment those pieces are now present for us now let's go back to the view and assign our boundary conditions here uh, we are not having any excavation this is not support uh, there's no support we are not doing solid analysis in groundwater tap uh, the boundary conditions that we have in this domain are a total head of 115 feet. So total head 115. We have two more boundary conditions. This one is the seepage space downstream. The seepage space is the unknown boundary condition. And we have the relief valves. And they have total head of 106.5. Okay. Now I'm going to go to face selection and just going to reduce the transparency so that my selections are going to be uh, appearing much clearer uh, upstream. I'll assign my total at 115. I'm holding control and selecting these pieces of surface at upstream. And also in this view, the piece of the wall that is in, in contact with the water. So all these pieces, they will get total head of 115. Uh, all the pieces in downstream, the top surface, I'm gonna assign my uh, seepage face, holding control. These two small pieces also, top surface, this one and this one. So all of them, they will get seepage face. Now, inside the domain, I have to go assign my uh, relief wells to visually uh, make it easier to see what I'm doing. I'm just gonna hide these whole boundary conditions here. And also I'm gonna go to entity selection, select these two and hide them. Now I'm maximizing the 3D view. Rotate it a little bit. Uh, these edges that you see here, I want my relief valves to be located, placed at these edges, at 50 feet, or 50 feet distance from each other. So I'm gonna go to edge selection, zoom in a little bit. This edge, I'm holding control, click. Control is still holding. I'm getting all these edges. All of them are selected, and I'm assigning that relief field boundary condition to these. Okay, now everything is defined. 
let me go to view and show all the intersected geometries, uh, get back what I had for boundary conditions. Uh, there's no load, no restraint because we are only running seepage analysis. We have to go to mesh. Uh, the default option that I have for the mesh is four noded graded. Let's go with the default, see what we are getting here. Uh, the geometry is rather complex. We have all these pieces of geometry in it. Yet again, the meshing algorithm is quite fast and we have the mesh here. Uh, let's take a look at the section, uh, ZX. Uh, what I see here, I see a rather large element in the area that I'm interested in, the area that I have the well, and also the levy. What I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna assign a refinement area around the area that I'm interested in. Let me turn off the view for the mesh. So I'm gonna, the box, the green box that you are seeing here is going to be my refinement area. So it's gonna go from minus 100, 10, covering the whole length, minus 120, 120, and from depth of 70 to 120. This is 120, the depth is actually 70. Okay, so within this part, I will assign my refinement area. Uh, just uh, if you have any questions, please uh, type in the question box at the end of the presentation. We will try to answer as many as possible. And also my colleagues from the other offices will try to answer them uh, because they have access to computers and they can type answer for you. Okay, so this is going to be my refinement area, okay. Uh, done and what I'm going to use I'm using element size of uh, four feet now let's mesh it again so now we have that geometry that we had before on top of that we have a refinement area uh, the meshing will take just a little bit longer but as you see again it is very efficient you will have the mesh within a couple of seconds Now we have the mesh. Let's take a look at the mesh quality again. Uh, one exit plane. We can see that, okay, this area that I was interested in, it has finer elements. So this mesh is good for me. Now, uh, everything is defined. We have the geometry, geology, boundary condition. We can go to compute. We can save the model. And we have two compute engines here. This one, uh, the original compute is for solid, and if you have fluid, both of them together, we are only looking at groundwater calculation. So I'm gonna go with this blue calculator, which is compute groundwater only. I'll press this one. Pressing this is gonna go right uh, your input file, the compute file that the finite element engine is going to run, uh, read and run the simulation on it. Uh, we have only one stage. These are the iteration that we are running. Uh, the complexity in the model is because of the nonlinear material and also the complex uh, seepage phase condition that we have in it. But uh, it's just a matter of seconds. You have the results. You can take a look at them. The results that we have here, we don't have any of these solid results. We have the seepage analysis results. Let's look at the total head. We are looking at total head results. Let me uh, activate show the exterior contours. So you can clearly see uh, the effects of those uh, relief wells. The other thing that I'm gonna do here, I will uh, uh, add a section. Then I will add two contour planes on XZ. I'm gonna just put it just below the section that I cut. And I'm gonna put another section, uh, contour section right at the location that I have the wells. So YZ, and I'm gonna move it close to the area that I have those relief wells. Uh, let me maximize the 3D view, rotate it in this area. 
now you can see the effect of those relief wells that are installed at 50 feet uh, distance from each other. Now, uh, you can actually look at the phreatic surface of the water table. If you do that, you can go to ISO surfaces, add one for pressure equal to zero or pressure head equal to zero. That is going to generate your uh, water table. If I select it from the view here, you can see the location of it in the domain which is very similar to what we saw in RS2 when you had the well installed for you. So uh, what I, but the method that I used here for uh, installing and assigning those what the well, uh, relief wells, I actually divided the geometry based uh, using the segmenter tool and I assigned those relief wells as boundary condition. Uh, from last week, we have uh, developed non-mesh conforming relief wells. Uh, our in-house finite element expert, uh, Dr. Dank, developed these uh, specifically for this purpose. Now I will show you how these non-mesh conforming relief wells work. So if you see this piece of geometry now, the one that I installed the uh, relief wells before, it's intact, but I have relief wells now. Relief wells, uh, if you go, I go to the dialogue, the dialogue is still being in developed, so uh, I can assign any number of these relief wells. Let's say uh, in X direction, I want three of them. In Y direction, I want 10 of them. You can preview. These are all the wells that I'm assigning in that layer. So you have this flexibility of assigning these relief wells with total head and all that. And uh, this could be easily manipulated it is non-mesh conforming, so you can put it at any location in the domain and uh, quite easy, depending on the complexity of the geometry, maybe you cannot uh, manipulate the geometry as well, like uh, with the segmenter method that I use. So these ones are geometry independent and mesh independent, and these are going to be available uh, through our maintenance bus program. And uh, as we develop the features, they will be available uh, to our users. So what I have here equivalent to the other model, we have all these wells installed at uh, 50 feet apart. Now let's take a look at the results for this one, <clears throat> compare it to the other case that I actually used, the segmenter. Let me hide all geometries and I only show you the section cuts and those similar contours that I had. Let's look at total head. almost the same view. So this is the case that we use the relief wells and uh, this is the other case. That we use those regular boundary conditions. So these are pretty equivalent to each other. Both of these features are available to your user uh, soon. Okay, and let's go back to the presentation. Uh, looking at the results for this, if you do all your calculation for factor of safety also, uh, I have given you the chart here uh, for between, uh, based on the distance that you have between these wells, you can get different factors of safety. But uh, we will address this later in our next presentation. The other example that I will show you here is a steady state analysis dam, uh, uh, a steady state seepage analysis that we do on a dam. Uh, the, what I have is the, I will start with the, the uh, rather fresh file that I have project setting and the material properties in it. Uh, I will generate the geology and also generate the um, <clears throat> geometry for the dam. We assign the properties. We do the groundwater boundary condition. I will introduce the smart selection option. We mesh it and we compute and we get the results. Okay. This example starts from, let me close all the previous files. Start 
starting from almost scratch. The only thing that I have set in this file is the project setting and the material properties. Uh, I have received a message that the maintenance plus and the alpha will be available uh, to our users next week. So project setting, this one is using metric units, permeability meter per second, and we are running groundwater analysis, steady state only. The materials that I have in this domain, <clears throat> we have a bunch of materials, different uh, section for the dam, and we have two layers that we have for the geology. Uh, to create the geometry of the domain, uh, what I'm using here, I'm importing 3D surfaces. Top surface and the geology layer, these two are introduced to the domain to just create the geology of the model. Select all of them, post-processing, and uh, you can, because these are general 3D surfaces, you can fix them here, analyze them, then bring them in your model, because if you have surfaces that they have issues, later on you will have issues with them meshing and creating your model. This one doesn't have many issues, but yet again, I will repair it. And uh, most of them are, most of the problem are disappeared. Only one left here. I can apply repair again, and that piece also will be fixed. Okay done. Now we have these two surfaces coming in, the geology layer and the top layer. Uh, between these two hills here, this one and this one, is the location that I will put the body of the dam. But uh, first, let's start building the geology. Then I will, after the, having the geology, I'll be bringing the, uh, the dam sections added to the geology. Uh, we need to have the external box. I'm going to use the default box option here. This green area is going to be the external boundary for me. Within this domain, I'm going to extend the Z direction so that uh, the extent of the model below the surface is uh, you have some dimension. You are calculating uh, your problem appropriately. And also at this corner, if you see, I zoom in, uh, the box is not actually covering the whole surface, the top surface. I'm just going to bring it a little bit down so that all these surfaces two surfaces, they will have an intersection with the box. Okay. Now we are dividing all. Now the box will interact with these two surfaces. What we will have is going to be uh, two layers of geology. And on top of that, we have air. So this will be the air. In the, at the top that I will get rid of eventually. Uh, this one is going to be uh, the damage material number three, damage double G3. And the one at the bottom is going to be damage double G1, which is the stronger material comparing to the top surface. Okay. Now uh, I can actually So these are the geologies. Uh, the type of uh, <coughs> geometry files, the format of the file, we have many options to import geometries to the domain. And uh, let me just, because I'm bringing more pieces of geometry, I can show you that. Uh, I will create the dam sections now, the list of the material, the different type of geometry files that we can bring in are all presented here. What I'm bringing now, uh, for the geology and top surface, I use SDL format for the dam section. I'm bringing polyline that are actually DXF. This is the center of the dam, the dam body, and uh, the left and right side of it. I'm holding shift, selecting all these entities, bringing them in. These are all polyline. I can bring them all together. I don't need to fix it. These are polyline. There's no issues with them. So these polylines are located at the one side of the uh, domain between these two hills that I mentioned before, and we'll extrude it from one hill to the other one. So what I'm going to do to create the dam section, I'm selecting all of these polylines, holding shift, clicking the whole area. I will extrude them. 
the direction of extrusion is usually normal to the plane of all these entities, which is already set for me. If you want, you can change it as well here. I will extrude it with the offset of minus 10 meter with a depth of uh, 200 feet. You can preview. You can see that, okay, the dam is actually covering the whole area between these two hills. It is closed volume and okay. Now, uh, all these pieces of entities that I have here, the first three, they have locks in front of them. These are part of the model. The dam is still not part of the model yet. And uh, what I would like to do is to bring the dam, put it on top of the existing geology. I don't want these dam section to actually cut through the geology layer. I want them to cut through the air layer, create new geometry, and I want them to be sitting on the existing geology top surface. To do that, there are many ways to do this. What I'm gonna do, I will turn the role of these two geology layers to construction and the rest of them, they will be geology. So these two layers are going to be construction. The rest of them, air and the dam body are going to be geology. Now, if I go divide all, divide all is only operating on the geology pieces. So divide all is going to intersect the air on top of the dam on top of the top surface with all these prisms that I created for dam body. Let's do that. The pieces of geometry are rather complex, but yet again, quite fast. We have all these pieces of geometry created. Now, uh, what I would like to do, all these pieces are created for me. I will assign the properties uh, accordingly and I will get rid of the extra pieces that I have in the domain. So this piece and this one, I'll turn the role back to geology. This top piece that was air, I'll change it to construction. And these are all still geology. Let me hide the air as well. Now you can see that in terms of geometry, the dam is actually in the domain. Now let's go assign the material properties to it. So this is the sections of the dam. These are the section that I extruded from that uh, polyline, cut it through the air, and they are sitting on top of the, the top surface of the geology. I'm assigning these material properties to these domains. One by one, click here, grab it, bring it here, click here, drop them in here. That's my filter. And this is the LPF. Okay, uh, this is the geometry of the dam that is sitting on top of those uh, top surface now. Uh, what I can see here, there are these two small pieces, as you see, these are highlighted here. These two are still uh, the result of the interaction that I had between the prism of the dam body and air. These two are actually extra pieces. I should get rid of them. What I'm gonna do, I'll select these both, change the role to construction, and now we have one, two, three, and the air. These are all construction. Uh, I can select them all. And I can actually go to geometry and get rid of them. Discard these selected construction geometries. So this is a very clean geometry and geology that we have for the dam model. The next step would be assigning the boundary conditions here. Uh, my assumption is that the uh, upstream, we have water table standing at the elevation of 240, and downstream we have uh, seepage phase and water can flow through this uh, narrow river that we can create at the downstream valley. To create those boundary conditions, I'll bring another horizontal plane. I'll put the location at 240, you can preview it. It's gonna stand at this location. This is the our reserve here in upstream. I'm gonna do another divide off. So those pieces of geometry will be created for me. Then I can assign my boundary condition to it. Now, uh, there's no excavation, no support in groundwater tab. I will define my boundary condition the boundary condition that I have, I have total head in upstream, which is 240 meter, 240. 
and I have seepage facing downstream. Seepage phase is going to be my unknown. Okay. Now, uh, to select the areas that I would like to assign this boundary condition to, the top surface in upstream, all of this surface should get that boundary condition. Uh, if I select different pieces of surface, that is not going to help me. Even if I select control and select different pieces, this kind of selection is not going to help me much. It's going to be very difficult to do that. To uh, overcome this problem, we have the option of smart selection. If I hold shift, and select this area, this is automatically going to guess what was the area that I've actually intended to select for my boundary condition assignment. So this whole area that is going to be under the water is selected here. Uh, I will actually have to select this dam body as well. Uh, and I have to go in and unselect these two pieces from the side. I'm holding control and clicking these two and this side also, hold control, select. So the whole upstream now that is going to be submerged in my, uh, <clears throat> under the water, we get the total head of 240. I will use the same mythology in downstairs, the in down, the downstream, hold shift, select, and also control this part of the dam body and turn around these areas. I would like to unselect them. I'm holding control, select this, unselect this part, and also zoom in, unselect that part. So these area, they all are going to get my space face condition. Okay, now I have the geometry geology, define everything is defined properly, the boundary conditions are assigned properly. The next step would be going to the mesh. The mesh that I'm using here is the four node that graded, one click mesh. With all the complexities that we have in this geometry, all these pieces of jagged geometry surfaces, still the meshing, meshing algorithm is efficient enough you can see within a couple of seconds, you have the mesh ready for you. Okay, mesh is ready. Uh, let's cut the section through it. X, uh, Z. The mesh doesn't look bad. I just adjusted the transparency so that we can see the mesh. Mesh is okay. We can go to compute. Uh, save the model and call for uh, groundwater calculation only. I press this one, it is going to save the compute file for the engine and bring up the engine for groundwater analysis. The file is rather big. You have 250,000 almost elements. It will take a little bit of time to save and run it. But yet again, you will see that uh, within a matter of seconds, less than a minute, you will have the results for this simulation as well. The complexities that we have in this model are coming from the complex geometry, the nonlinear hydraulic properties that we have for the materials, and also the complexity that we have for the uh, seepage phase boundary condition. The new seepage phase boundary condition that we have in RS2 and RS3 and for our finite element program is very efficient, it's very fast. And uh, even with that, sometimes because it's more complex than the total head and other boundary condition, it will take just a little bit of time. So within 81 iterations, we have the results. You can go take a look at the results here now. We only have the seepage analysis results. Let's look at the total head first. So this was my upstream total head 240, and we had the downstream here. We have the flow. So this side is getting lower values. You can take a look at uh, pore pressure as well. And you can also look at the 
phreatic surface. Let me add phreatic surface total pressure zero. Let's add that one. Uh, let's turn off the exterior cartoon so that you can see the water surface. This is our water surface. If I add the transparency for all of these, you can see this is the area upstream and this is that small river that is forming in downstream. Also, you can uh, add sections to the domain. You can rotate and move the section and like put it at the section that you have the maximum length of the dam. And also you can bring in uh, contours, exit. And I can do the same thing with the contour plane as well. Rotate it and move it close to the section for the purpose of uh, a nice presentation. Double click, this is the 3D view. That's your water surface. And you have the pore water pressure, pressure distribution in the domain as well. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go back to the presentation. Uh, the next example, I will not uh, generate the model from scratch. But I will mention what are the steps you need to take to create this model. Uh, you will start with project setting. You create the geology and geometry using boreholes, and then you will create the embankment using DXF files and a loft operation on it. You will stage the embankment construction, loading, and consolidation, and mesh, refine mesh, compute, and you can look at, you can look at the results. Uh, at the end of it, I will introduce the uh, Vic terrain as well. Okay, uh, let's look at the models here. Let me close the original or the old ones. Uh, this simulation comparing to the other one, this is consolidation. You have stages. Let me show all intersected geometries. Let's look at the project setting. Uh, metric, you have multiple stages. You have initial condition, then you have time, which is transient, and you run the consolidation problem here. Uh, the solver is coupled. We are using, we are using bio formulation that is accounting for hydromechanical coupling. And uh, the stages of model, you have the initial, then you have different layers of embankment introduced to the domain. At the stage six, uh, the whole embankment is constructed. You have a load coming here as well. And after that, you have time for dissipation of excess pore water pressure and uh, uh, more settlement happening. Now let's look at the results here. Let's look at the uh, stage 10 for uh, stage three, 10 days. Let's look at the uh, excess pore water pressure. So we have two layers of embankment and within that clay layer, which is actually using a camp clay material model and uh, with a low permeability, you can see that you have the generation of excess pore water pressure, maximum value there. Let me just show you <clears throat> the results in sections. And uh, stage five is your maximum level of load and construction. And after that, as you see, the time passes, the bubble that you have here for the excess pore water pressure will gradually spread around and dissipate throughout the domain. As you see, the value is dropping and the bubble is spreading around. You have the drainage and dissipation of excess pore water pressure. After one year, everything is almost settled down. And at the end of it, I have another steady state condition, assuming that all the pore water pressure has been dissipated. Now, uh, let's look at 
settlement here. Let's look at uh, set displacement. Uh, another option that I would like to show you here is uh, we have reference stages. So I will look at the settlement compared to the original state that we had. So I can reference everything with respect to stage number one. All the deformation that you see here are going to be calculated based on the uh, construction of this embankment. So at 60 day end of construction, this is the deformation field that you have under the embankment. It's uh, like uh, 14 centimeters. After 120 days that you gave some time to the domain, um, pore water pressure has been dissipated. Uh, maximum deformation is 15 centimeter. After a year, it is 17. And finally, in everything, every pore water pressure, excess pore water pressure is dissipated. Your maximum deformation is uh, 19 centimeter. Now, the simulation that I showed you here was just general consolidation problem. Uh, like the option that I showed you for relief valves, we have option for weak drains. Uh, weak drains, uh, with the same principle, we can apply weak terrain to the domain. And let me show you how it works. Uh, you can assign weak terrain similarly to what I used in for relief valves. Like this example, we are installing <coughs> relief valves at the end of construction. And we are keeping them for a period of 60 days. And once again, this placement of these weak terrains, let me bring up the dialogue for this. You can adjust the spacing between them. If you want more of these weak terrains, let's see two and two preview. These are all going to be your weak terrains. You can assign them at any uh, location uh, and you can actually orient them in different orientation as well. And we are done with the dialogue for this. Now, looking at the results for this one, let's look at the effect of these weak terrains. I'm gonna go at the end of construction. Let's look at excess pore water pressure. I'm changing the view to be equivalent to what we had before. Hide all geometry, just give me the two contours and the section. So at the end of 60 days, this is similar to what we saw before. Now at 61, we have the weak drains coming in. You can see that they are actually draining the excess pore water pressure out of the domain. And the process of uh, consolidation, dissipation of excess pore water pressure is much faster uh, by the installment of these weak drains. Okay. Uh, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, so these are the comparing results of excess pore water pressure when you have the victory and when you don't have them. Uh, please request your RS3 trial. You can try all of these and also the latest version with maintenance plans will be available from next week. And now let's uh, try and uh, look at the list of questions that we have here and I'll try to answer as many as I can. Uh, what is the element size for the mesh refinement? Uh, for mesh refinement, you have many options for it. What I used here for the first case, I used uh, four feet, but uh, in actuality, if I'm going to run the seepage analysis and on top of that, I'm going to run the slope stability, I might actually go for lower size. The size of the wall that I had was like 12 feet. Uh, four feet size of element, maybe it's too big. I might go maybe for two feet. And also I will use uh, 10 nodal elements. I was using four nodal elements here. It's much faster uh, and for preliminary analysis is much better. Uh, what is the iteration process? 500, okay, the, those convergence criteria that we have in RS2 and RS3, uh, the tolerance one E minus three and 500 number of iteration, these are rather standard in uh, uh, industry of finite element. If you have, uh, complexities in the domain, if you have very high nonlinear material, or if you have joint network and all that, you might actually increase the number of iteration if you would like. But typical finite element analysis, the 500 iteration tolerance of one E minus three is good enough. Uh, 
I think another question. Uh, for negative for water pressure cutoff, uh, that only means that when we are calculating the effective stresses uh, in unsaturated zones, that negative for water water pressure will increase the effective stress. And in some cases, that is not realistic. And because of that, increasing the effective stress, you will get higher strength and uh, you will not calculate your stability properly. In those cases, we recommend that you cut uh, you put a limit for that negative suction that you are applying in the calculation of ex, uh, the calculation of effective stress. Uh, yes, for geometry, uh, we have so many input file input format you can use all of them. R3 is able to handle most of them. Is there a way to model smear with drains or any way yet incorporate a slight loss of impermeability? Yes, uh, the dialog as I showed you here, <clears throat> you can actually in, uh, assign permeability and uh, diameter for those uh, weak drains and uh, uh, relief valves. Those are going to be controlling to see how much flow is coming out of those weak drains or how much flow is coming from the wells. If uh, the boundary condition that I assign initially is going to be generate more flow than the limit that we assign with that diameter and permeability, those will be limited to that. Okay, uh, thank you very much, guys. Thank you for attending. Uh, if you would like, if you have more questions, uh, please email us. We'll be happy to address them. And thank you very much.